give God a hand this morning. So thank you. I know that for many Americans watching right now, the state of our economy is a concern that rises above all others, and rightly so. If you haven't been personally affected by this recession, you probably know someone who has. A friend, a neighbor, a member of your family. You don't need to hear another list of statistics to know that our economy is in crisis because you live it every day. It's the worry you wake up with and the source of sleepless nights. It's the job you thought you'd retire from but now have lost, the business you've built your dreams upon that's now hanging by a thread, the college acceptance letter your child had to put back in the envelope. The impact of this recession is real, and it is everywhere. But while our economy may be weak, and our confidence shaken, though we are living through difficult and uncertain times, tonight I want every American to know this. We will rebuild, we will recover, and the United States of America will emerge stronger than before. You know, politicians like to make promises. And uh, I was fascinated by watching that, how even in that set of promises there at the end, uh, he's outlining the frustration of people in our country, but he's talking to people who have their jobs. And he's talking to people in that room who have no risk of losing their jobs. And so it raises this weird kind of question of who is he promising this success to, and can we rely on it? And, you know, I'm not going to um, talk about politics today. What I'm going to do is I'm going to shift our focus to say politicians promise lots of things lots of times. And yet uh, there are often times when the promises are not fulfilled in exactly the way that uh, they promised them. However, God's promises are guaranteed. We're in a series of messages right now that I've called Guaranteed. And we are looking at some of the promises of God in the Bible and we're addressing them from the perspective of what difference does it make in our lives. Uh, part, there are two reasons we're going through this series. Reason number one is that yes, we are living in turbulent times right now. And while the economy is growing smaller and jobs are getting fewer, the government is growing larger and there are these questions that rise in all of our hearts and we might have the question of whether or not there's anything solid for us to stand on. And so one reason we're doing this series is so that we can all remember that God has made us some really firm, solid, guaranteed promises. Places from which we can stand and then move out into the world and make a difference in this world. It's a, it's a place for us to get some stability when we remember God's promises. The second reason we're talking about God's promises is that just a couple weeks ago we went through this time of commitment. We call it Commitment Sunday. It was four, about three weeks ago, and we walked along the front here, and we signed a commitment book, and I know many of you made that commitment. You wanted to go public with that commitment. And so, uh, I just wanted to encourage, take a few weeks to encourage those of you who did make a commitment, those of you who haven't yet, or those of you who are still processing through that kind of stuff, making a commitment either to this church or to God, whatever that might mean for you right now, I wanted to encourage you. By taking nine weeks to prove to you that God is far more committed to you than you ever could be to Him. And so, we've already looked at a couple promises. The first promise is that God is willing to give you everything you need for you to become like Jesus. He's ready. And then the second promise is that God is giving us His strength. If He has our heart, then He will give us His strength. And in fact, His full power, His strength goes along with us wherever we are, in whatever situation we need, so long as he has our heart fully. That's the promise he gave us last week. Well, today, I'm going to go ahead and just outline our promise for today. This is it. In Jesus, I am free. In Jesus, I am free. Now, I know that initially, since we live in this country, we hear the word free or freedom or liberty, and we think politics. I am politically free in the sense that there's no government official acting like a king or despot who could just simply violate the laws 
and throw me into prison for no good reason in most cases. Uh, you know, there's always seems to be, there always seem to be exceptions, but we live in a country where we are largely free. And so maybe we're thinking that this kind of message doesn't really click with us. But you know, the Bible is filled with promises about freedom. It's filled with it. I mean, from cover to cover, God is trying to teach his people some lessons about freedom and what it means to live as free people. So we're going to look at some of those lessons today as we prepare our hearts for an incredible time of freedom towards the end of this service. Uh, would you turn with me to John chapter 8? We're going to look at verses 31 through 36. If you're using one of the Bibles we've passed out, it's on page 743. Turn with me there, and we're going to read it and kind of walk through it a little bit and then draw some lessons out of it. John chapter 8, beginning in verse 31. Jesus has been speaking to a crowd of people, and he's been telling them that he is from the Father in heaven. That God the Father has sent him. In fact, later on in the same chapter, Jesus will unequivocally claim to be equal with God. In fact, to be the very God of the Old Testament who spoke to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all of them. That happens in John 8, 58. If you ever wanted to see Jesus tell people that he was God, he actually says it. We're not going to cover that passage today, but that's just giving you kind of a context of what we are talking about. Verse 31, 